I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. So you survived the 4th of July weekend? Yes. Boy, most of you didn't even respond. I'm not sure whether you survived it or not, huh? I, uh, I spoke in our, our Spanish service just a few moments ago, and everybody was kind of dead in there, and I asked them if their 4th of July weekend is like ours, because our holidays are almost all the same. Doesn't matter whether it's 4th of July, whether it's uh, Easter or Christmas or Thanksgiving. Here's what we do as a family. We eat. <laughs> and then we sleep. And then we eat again. And then we sleep a little bit later. And then we come back and eat again. And it seems like every meal is just a, a little bit bigger. And uh, I, I'm going to confess, I don't know whether I should or not, but I ate so much this week, it's unbelievable. I'm, I'm actually shocked that I can fit into my clothes this morning. But uh, I was able to. Good to see you today. Good to see some of our newlyweds back. We have several of our newlyweds that are here that have been on their honeymoons. And uh, I'm not going to make them stand, but they know who they are. And uh, we're glad that you're here. I do hope that you had a wonderful 4th of July. I know this is the middle of vacation season, and we have so many of our folks that are gone uh, this weekend, but I'm so glad that you have chosen to be with us. On Friday, we celebrated the 238th anniversary or birthday, I guess, of the United States of America. The 4th of, yeah, we, that's something to, to clap about and to celebrate. By the way, I wrote in a bulletin article last week, I trust that you did several things on the 4th of July. Number one, I trust that you paused for a moment and thanked God for the freedom that we have in our country. Let's not take that for granted. And the second thing that I trust that you did is that you prayed for our country. God answers prayer, and we need desperately to pray for our country and to pray for our leaders. And uh, I trust that you did that the 4th of July, though, has become a day in which we get together with family, we barbecue, and watch fireworks. I know many of you, I saw Facebook posts, many of you were at Hollywood Beach in different places enjoying the uh, fireworks display. It's become one of our primary national holidays, and uh, as well it should. Today, though, I'd like to speak about another holiday. You said, Brian, what are you talking about? Well, a holiday that many of us do not celebrate. I'm speaking of the ascension of Jesus. You say, Brian, what are you talking about that being a holiday? Well, as I'll mention in just a few moments, there are literally countries around the world that celebrate the ascension of Jesus. It is one of their holidays. And quite frankly, I confess that we don't celebrate it, we don't mention it near as much as we should. As a matter of fact, let me ask, has anybody here ever celebrated Ascension Day? Anybody here? A couple of folks have. Uh, kudos to you as, we, uh, as you celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Take your bulletins, and I want to begin by us quoting part of the Apostles' Creed. As Mark mentioned just a few moments ago, there is a reason for our madness. We are studying this because it is so very important that we know what we believe. I would encourage you to memorize the Apostles' Creed, so that you can state with conviction and with force what it is that you believe. But let's read the beginning. I'll put it up there on the screen. I want to read the phrases that we have studied so far. So would you read that with me? Let's read it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. I believe in Jesus Christ, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. Those are fantastic truths that I trust each and every one of us here today believe. Today's statement, though, is this. You can, put, you can see it in your bulletin. I'll put it up on the screen. I believe that Jesus ascended to heaven and that he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Wait, would you say that with me this morning? Let's say it together. We'll start with the words, I believe. Ready? I believe he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Let's say it one more time together, would you? I believe that he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Let's pray together today. Father, I pray that you would strengthen our belief. We realize today that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so, Lord, as we study your word, I pray that you would increase our faith. God, I pray that you would increase our belief. God, help us not just to have a, a head knowledge of what we believe, but Help us to have a heart knowledge of what we believe. Father, help us not just to have an, intellect, an intellectual conviction as to our beliefs, but God, help us to have a heartfelt passion as to what we believe. Father, I pray that our beliefs would not just be internalized, but Father, as we'll see in today's passage, that our beliefs should be externalized as well. Lord, help us to not be ashamed of that which we believe. In a day and age in which many of our beliefs are not politically correct, we understand that, God. And yet I pray that you'd help us never to be embarrassed of you. Help us never to be embarrassed of that which we believe. God, I pray if there's somebody here today that is never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They've never personally applied that, that intellectual belief that they have of God. May today be the day that they give their heart and life to you. God, I pray for each and every one of us as we study this great truth. Help us to realize that, that you, Jesus, are actively at work for our sanctification. God, you were working so that we might grow and so that we might serve you. God, I pray you'd help us to take advantage of that in our spiritual walk. Now we pray the Holy Spirit of God today would take the word of God, challenge us, convict us, instruct us, motivate us to be the followers that you would have us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just a few introductory facts about the ascension as I mentioned a few moments ago, Ascension Day, also notice that known as the Feast of Ascension, is one of the important Christian festivals celebrated all over the world. As a matter of fact, it is a public holiday in certain countries around the world, many of them being European countries. And yet, the Ascension is one of the most neglected stories of the New Testament. I say that as an indictment to myself because in 30 years of preaching as I began studying this passage, I realized that not one time have I preached a message that was focused entirely on the ascension. There's been times that I've mentioned the ascension and, and obviously it's something that we're aware, uh, aware of and cognizant of, but I've never focused one message just on the ascension. And I'm afraid that often we ignore the importance of this great Bible truth. The ascension was prophetically announced by David. We'll see that in just a few moments in Psalm 110. It was also prophetically announced by Jesus Christ himself. There were times that he looked at the disciples and said, I'm going away. As a matter of fact, I am returning to my Father. The disciples didn't get it. We might not have got it either, but Jesus prophetically announced it. Here's another cool point. Jesus didn't ascend to heaven, though, until 40 days after 
his resurrection. Obviously, that's a fact that, that, that many people don't understand. We read, especially in the Gospel of Luke, as we'll read in just a few moments, we read Luke chapter 24, which the first part of the chapter deals with his resurrection, and we read just a few verses later, and it's talking about the fact that Jesus ascended up into heaven. And if we're not careful, we think that those were events that just followed one right after the other. Jesus resurrected, and a few hours or maybe a few days later, boom, he was gone. But that wasn't the case. He was here for for 40 days after his resurrection. Now, some might ask Brian, why in the world did not Jesus ascend immediately? Why did he hang around for 40 days? Let me give you three reasons. I didn't put them in your notes. Let me give you three reasons why Jesus stayed for 40 days. First of all, to demonstrate the reality of his resurrection. As Jose mentioned last week, Jesus appeared repeatedly to people after he rose from the dead. As a matter of fact, there are 11 separate resurrection occurrences in the New Testament. Jesus rose from the dead, and over and over again, he appeared to people. Why? He wanted the reality, the veracity of his resurrection to be a fact, a witness, historical fact. So he stayed around for 40 days. That wasn't the only reason, though. He stayed around to further train his disciples. And even though he wasn't with them as frequently as he was during his three and a half years of ministry, there were times that Jesus appeared to the disciples, and I'm very confident that he further taught them. But I believe one of the most important reasons why Jesus hung around is he wanted to prepare them for their mission. You see, Jesus realized that when he left, he was leaving his followers with an unbelievable mission, an unbelievable commission that they needed to take upon themselves and they needed to fulfill. And so we find Jesus several times preparing his disciples for the task that they would have whenever he departed from them. So as a result, Jesus hung around for 40 days, verifying his resurrection, teaching the disciples, and preparing them for their mission. Now, now the ascension is not found in all of the Gospels. As a matter of fact, it's not found in Matthew, and it's not found in John. But we find the ascension in several passages, and I want to read them together today. And so if you would turn with me, first of all, to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, and we'll notice the last two verses of the book of Mark. Mark chapter 16, verses 19 and 20. Mark 16, 19 and 20. I'll put it up on the screen. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was, very simple language, he was taken up into heaven. And and notice right away what it says. It says, and he sat down in the place of, of honor at God's right hand. We'll talk about that in just a few moments. Verse 20, and the disciples went everywhere and preached, and the Lord worked through them, confirming what they had said by many miraculous signs. So, So in a very unglamorous way, Mark ends his gospel simply saying, Jesus was taken up to heaven. Go with me to the end of Luke. The last verses in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 50. Luke 24, beginning in verse 50. Then Jesus led them to Bethany, and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. There's a lot, there's a couple of cool points there because the disciples didn't know that Jesus was about to depart. He didn't give them a memo saying on this day I'm leaving. Man, they didn't have any idea. Jesus was just ministering to them, ministering with them. And here in the passage, he takes the disciples to Bethany. He's blessing them. And while he is blessing them, the text says, he was taken up to heaven. Verse 52, the response So they worshiped him and then returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy. They spent all of their time in the temple praising God. Now, Luke tells us about the ascension here. Luke actually tells us about the ascension twice. 
He ends the Gospel of Luke with the Ascension, and he begins his next volume with the book, which is the book of Acts, talking about the Ascension as well. Acts, or excuse me, Luke tells the story of Christ coming to earth. Acts tells the story of the coming of the Holy Spirit and the fulfillment of the Great Commission and the establishment of the church. So Luke ends his gospel talking about the ascension, and then he begins his historical book talking about the ascension. So go with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Acts 1, beginning in verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus... They kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? We'll talk about that in just a moment. But, but the disciples, man, they were all about, you know, chronology and times. Man, when is the fulfillment going to come? Tell us when this is going to happen. Notice verse 7. Jesus replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times They are not for you to know. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. If you underline in your Bible, the word witness is a great word to underline. We'll talk about it at the conclusion of the message. You will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. It's really interesting. I don't know whether you're interested, but, but, the, but the word that is used for a cloud is interesting because sometimes I've pictured it. I'm not sure how you picture it, that Jesus is standing on this hill. He's talking to the disciples. All of a sudden, this cloud comes. While he's talking, he's enveloped in a cloud. And the disciples are like, where did Jesus go? And all of a sudden, this cloud kind of floats up into heaven, and Jesus is gone. The terminology that's used in the New Testament is that Jesus literally, this is going to sound funny, but Jesus literally, literally rides the cloud to heaven. It's not necessarily that he's enveloped by a cloud, but he rides the cloud as if this divine chariot comes down from heaven. Jesus steps into the chariot, and the divine chariot, as he did with Elijah, the divine chariot takes Jesus to heaven in the form of a cloud. That's the terminology that's used in the passage. So it's not just that he was enveloped by a cloud. This cloud came him, was like his vehicle that transported him to his father. Verse 10 says this, as they strained to see him rising into heaven. By the way, you and I would do the exact same thing. If all of a sudden we were with Jesus and this cloud came and took him, man, we would be watching well until he was gone. Anybody ever watch the Challenger take off or something? And you stand there and you watch until you just can't see it anymore. And then you do what? You keep watching. And you keep watching just in case you're going to get a small glimpse of it up in the air. Imagine, that's exactly what the disciples did with Jesus. When all of a sudden, two white-robed men suddenly stood beside them. And the angels say this, men of Galilee, I love this question, men of Galilee, why are you standing staring into heaven? Now, to me, that sounds like a legitimate thing to do. Jesus had just ascended into heaven, and so you're going to what? You're going to stand there and watch him. But the angels come with this question like, what are you guys doing? Why are you just standing looking into heaven? And then the angel makes a couple of great statements. He says, Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday, He will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Listen, I'm going to put my own spin on that, and I believe here's what the angel is saying. The angel is saying, listen, quit wasting your time looking into heaven. Get busy. Get busy. He's coming back, and one day he's going to come back the same way that he left. But in the meantime, get busy. So this morning as we study the ascension of Jesus, I I admit that today's teaching is going to be a little bit more teaching than it is preaching. But let me give you several things that the ascension of Jesus accomplished. 
And, and, and I really want to ingrain in your mind and hearts today the idea that the work of Jesus is not done. The ascension of Jesus did not end his work. It only began his work. And so let me give you a couple of things. These are in your notes today. The first is this. The ascension culminates the earthly ministry of Jesus. The ascension culminates Jesus' earthly ministry. Now, that might be one of those duh facts where you look at me and say, okay, Brian, listen, you're the master of the obvious today. Are you going to tell us anything that we already don't know? We get it. Uh, when he ascended into heaven, his earthly work was done. Nevertheless, I find it interesting that often we highlight Jesus' arrival, but we downplay his departure. And, and, and think with me today, when you think about it, there are many similarities between Jesus' coming and Jesus' going. Let me, let me read you what one author said. One author said this, the story of Jesus began in heaven when he left and came to earth, and it ends when he leaves earth and returns to heaven. The story began with condensation, and it ends with ascension. The story began with incarnation and ends with exaltation, as we'll see in just a few moments. It begins with expectation and ends with consummation. It began with the Son of God being born of a virgin descending to earth, and it ends with the Son of God being born from the dead and ascending to heaven. The story began with hope unrealized and ends with hope fully realized. It began with a promise and it ends with a fulfillment of a promise. I find it so very interesting that, that we highlight and we should the incarnation, but for some reason we don't highlight, highlight the ascension of Jesus. And when Jesus came, he knew what he was going to accomplish. But when he left, it was already accomplished. When Jesus came, he came to provide our salvation. But when he left, that salvation was already provided. And so the ascension culminated the earthly ministry of Jesus. Here's the second thing I want you to see. The ascension not only culminated the earthly ministry of Jesus, but it inaugurated Jesus' heavenly ministry. It inaugurated his heavenly ministry. When Jesus received, was received up into a heaven, a new ministry, some of it wasn't even actually new, but, but we can say just in generic terms that a new ministry began for him. Now it's important for us to realize that when Jesus left, he didn't take a hiatus. He didn't take a vacation. Some would sit back and say, man, after 33 and a half years of tough ministry, after you know, being persecuted, after dying, after being beaten, after being buried, after being ri uh, rise, or, uh, after having arisen from the dead, this guy deserved a vacation. And so here's Jesus, is seating at the right hand of the Father, and if we're not careful, we picture Jesus in a lazy boy chair with his feet up in the air, taking a well-deserved vacation. That's not a biblical picture. If that's our picture, that's not a biblical picture. Because when Jesus left, he didn't leave to rest. Jesus left to continue working for you and for me. So let me give you a couple of things that, that the ascension of Jesus kind of prompted, that started, that whenever he ascended into heaven, it was like one of those you know, effects that this happened and then this happened as well. Let me give you several of them today. The first is this, and man, we could, maybe should take an entire message on this, but the first is this. When Jesus arrived in heaven, he is exalted and he is enthroned as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Man, just try to imagine for a second. I just talked with our Spanish folks a few moments ago and we tried to imagine the reception of Jesus in heaven. Now, now we understand receptions, do we not? Man, we, we know what it's like to uh, 
receive the Miami Heat after they've won the world championship and they drive down Biscayne Boulevard and there's crowds that are roaring and there's parades and there's confetti being thrown in the air and people are yelling and people are screaming. Why? Because the victorious team has come home. Magnify that a million times over. And Jesus, who left heaven with a job to do, now returns to heaven with the job being done. Jesus left heaven and took upon a humble servant's attitude, and he returns to heaven as the rewarded, exalted, conquering king. Jesus left heaven with the plan of providing for our salvation. He returns to heaven with that salvation now fully provided for. And when Jesus returned to heaven, he was enthroned and he was um, coronated and exalted as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let me give you a couple of verses. Psalm chapter 110, or Psalm 110 and verse one, David makes reference to this. Notice what David said in verse one of Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Now once again, if we're not careful, we read through that and we fail to realize what is taking place. This is a messianic psalm. It's a psalm in which David is talking about the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus Christ, and he's prophetically talking about it. Jesus' welcome home in heaven. And he quotes the words of God the Father to God the Son, saying this, God says to God the Son, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool underneath your feet. Here's another great passage in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. Well, we'll start in verse 19, Ephesians 1, 19. Paul says this, and I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. Boy, we can just stop right there. Isn't that a great phrase? Paul says, I want you to understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. That greatness, that power is available for us. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Man, what a great, glorious passage that speaks about the exaltation of Jesus. I wrote down several things about God's right hand that's mentioned several times in the passage. First of all, God's right hand is a place of honor. God's right hand is a place of honor. Secondly, God's right hand is a place of authority. To sit at the right hand of an earthly king was a place of honor. It was something that was not just given. That right, that privilege was not just given to anyone. It was a place of extreme honor, donate, or denoting special trust, authority from, and a relationship with the king. To the people of Jesus' day, to the people of New Testament times, that was something that was completely understood and did not need explaining. If you were to sit at the right hand of the king meant that you acted with the king's authority. Those who came to you would treat you with respect and obedience as if you were the king yourself. So here's what the Bible says about Jesus. Whenever Jesus made that triumphal, victorious return into heaven, he was enthroned. He was coronated as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. 
Let me give you a, a second point, and we could pause and talk about all of these individually, but for time's sake, let me move quickly. The second thing that Jesus is doing in his ascension ministry is this. He is preparing a home for us. You're probably familiar with John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus says this, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There, there is more than enough room in my Father's home. There's more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, would not, would not I have told you I am going to prepare a place for you. And when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. You see, before Jesus ever ascended, before his death, before his resurrection, Jesus told the disciples, listen, one of these days I'm leaving, and as I go, I'm returning to the Father, but I'm returning to the Father with a purpose. And one of the purposes is I am, rep I am preparing a place for you. Now, depending upon the version that you have, there's many different words that are used. The King James says, I'm preparing a mansion for you. We like that, don't we? We all want a mansion. The ESV says, I'm preparing many rooms for you. The Holman translation says, I'm preparing many dwelling places. That, that reminds me of uh, the chorus that we sang when I was growing up. I, don't, I haven't heard it in a long time, but that chorus, I've got a mansion. Anybody know it? Just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but walk on streets that are pure as gold. Jesus said, hey, I'm going to prepare a mansion for you. Now we sit back and we always think, how big is my mansion going to be? And we kind of joke about, my mansion's going to be bigger than your mansion. You know, we kind of jest back and forth. I heard the story of a taxi driver who was transporting a pastor one day, and they were talking about heaven. The taxi driver basically said, you know what, my mansion in heaven's going to be bigger than yours. And the pastor was like, what in the world are you talking about? I dedicate my life to, you know, teaching the word of God. I dedicate my life to instructing people. And the taxi driver said it this way. He said, no, you don't get it. He said, whenever you stand up and teach, people sleep. He said, but whenever I drive, people pray. And he said, man, he said, because of what I do, people are a lot closer to God. My mansion is going to be bigger than yours. Well, sometimes we debate about that and we say, boy, God's got this huge mansion for us in heaven. But, but the idea that is being conveyed is not necessarily the hugeness of the estate, the largeness of the mansion, the house that God is preparing for us. Jesus is not telling us that heaven has compartments or, or that we will have little or big places to live. Catch this, in ancient culture, a father's house was where the extended family lived. Rooms were often added on as the, or, or as the family grew through birth and marriage. What Jesus was doing was using a present day illustration of a loving, tight family and community. Here's what he's saying, I'm going to heaven, but I'm adding on to my house because I want one day for you to be with me. And that's what he says there in John. He says, man, I want you to be with me. As a matter of fact, I'm coming back for you someday. After I finish the house, I'm coming back for you someday so that you can be with me. The significance of the passage is not the largeness of the mansion that God is making for us. The significance of the passage is this. We're going to spend all of eternity with the Father. And we're going to spend all of eternity with Jesus Christ. Christ is saying that he is preparing a place for us in heaven where we will dwell with God in close communion with him. 
And there is room in heaven for all who are called to salvation. What a great and glorious day that's going to be. Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I'm leaving to prepare a place for you. Let me show you a third thing that Jesus' ascension into heaven inaugurated. Actually, he did it before, but it's highlighted now. Thirdly, he intercedes to God on our behalf. The, the work of the risen Christ is one of interceding to God on our behalf. Let me show you a couple of verses. I think I have them in your notes. If not, you can write them down. Hebrews 7.25. This is a great passage. Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. Here's what he says, this next phrase. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. So Jesus says, hey, I'm, I'm going to heaven, but I'm going to heaven for the purpose of interceding to God the Father on your behalf. Now, a couple of things about that intercession. That intercession, as we just saw in this passage, that intercession is forever. By that, we mean that it's not temporary. His gifts, his abilities, his authority will never diminish. And if you study all of Hebrews chapter 7, the writer of Hebrews is comparing the ultimate eternal authority of Jesus Christ with the temporary authority of Old Testament priests. And the writer of Hebrews is saying that Jesus is so much better than them that Jesus will be able to intercede for us forever. There's a second thing that we can say when we talk about his intercession. His intercession results in our forgiveness. Let me show you two verses. They're two of my favorite verses in the New Testament. First John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. First John 2, 1 and 2. Here's what John says. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, let me just pause for a second. How many of us sin? All right. That's just about everybody. All right. Not all of you raised your hand. I like to talk with, I like to talk with the ones who didn't raise your hand afterward. I like to know what that's like to not sin. But, um, but if anyone does sin, notice what he says. We have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. Who is that advocate? He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but also the sins of the whole world. Catch what John is saying. John is saying, when we sin, if anybody does sin, we know we all sin. When we sin, we have an advocate. We have a lawyer. We have an, an intercessor with the Father. That intercessor is Jesus Christ. Let me, let me just paint a picture for you today of what happens when we sin and we confess our sin, okay? Let me use a, an illustration today. Let's imagine that Mark sins, all right? Now, Mark lives in our house, so I can verify the fact that Mark sins, all right? I, uh, I can verify that. The sad thing is, is I'm not going to tell you what they are, because Mark can verify the fact that I sin too, and so we're not going to go there today, all right? So, so, so Mark blows it, whatever it is. Mark blows it, does something that he knows dishonors God, does something that he knows displeases God. He realizes that. And so as a believer, he takes advantage of 1 John 1, 9, the verses pre previous to this, and goes to God the Father and says, man, God, I I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I know I shouldn't have responded that way. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. God the Father, will you please forgive me? Whenever Mark goes to God and asks for forgiveness of that way, here is what takes place in heaven. Jesus Christ, who's sitting right beside God the Father, says, can I interject something for just a moment here? And Jesus goes to God the Father and encourages God the Father to forgive Mark. 
And, and that encouragement is not based upon, he's not saying, hey God, you know what, if you forgive him this time, he'll never ever sin again. I promise you, he's a good guy, he just blew it once, he'll never sin again. Forgive him because he'll never do it again because we all know Mark and what? Mark's gonna do it again, all right? And so are you, <laughs> and so am I. That the forgiveness that Jesus intercedes for is not based upon Mark's righteousness, it's not based upon Mark's justice, it's not based upon Mark's goodness. It's based upon Jesus. It's based upon Jesus' righteousness. And it's based upon Jesus' goodness. And when Jesus goes to God the Father on God's behalf, he doesn't say, God, forgive Mark because of Mark. Here's what he says. God, forgive Mark because of me. Because the price of Mark's sin has already been paid for. Jesus intercedes for us. Listen, I want you to catch that, and I know I've said it over and over. He's not in heaven in a lounge chair not doing anything. He's interceding for you. He's going to bat for you. There's a third thing that I would say about his intercession. His intercession is compassionate. His intercession is compassionate. Hebrews chapter four and verse 15 says this, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. Listen, we can say he understands our temptations. He understands our doubts. He understands our fears. Why? Because he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So you have an active intercessor who daily, moment by moment, is seated at the right hand of the Father who is interceding for you. You see, the ascension of Jesus culminates his earthly ministry. It inaugurates his heavenly ministry. Let me show you a third thing. The ascension of Jesus signaled the sending of the Holy Spirit. The ascension of Jesus signaled the sending of the Holy Spirit. Here are Jesus' words in John chapter 16 and verse 5. Jesus says, but now I am going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. And if I do go away, then I will send him to you. Can you imagine the disciples' grief as Jesus looked at them and said, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. And by the way, where I'm going right now, you can't follow me. Later on, you can. We're going to be separated. The disciples were grieved by that. No, Jesus, don't go. Don't go. Please don't go. Jesus says, no, you don't, you don't get it. You don't get it. I need to go. Because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. In your notes, I wrote this. It was necessary for Jesus to go so that the Holy Spirit could come. There was a divine interaction that took place. When Jesus left, the Holy Spirit and Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is not coming until I leave. And so it's necessary for me to go. But there's a second thing Jesus said. He says, the arrival of the Holy Spirit was for their benefits. It was for their benefit. In verse 7, Jesus says, it is best for you. Depending upon your translation, some, some translations say, it's expedient for you. This is for your benefit that I leave. The disciples might sit back and say, well, Jesus, how can you say that? You, you've changed our lives. You've transformed our lives. Why, you've changed us from fishermen to, uh, to uh, preachers. You've, you've transformed us from men who were sinners to now men that are honoring you. Jesus, how can you say that it's to my benefit? And Jesus said, man, you don't get it because when I leave, the Holy Spirit is coming. And when the Holy Spirit is coming, 
is going to be able to accomplish in your life things that only he can accomplish. Think with me. Jesus, we've already spoken about this. Jesus was limited in time and scope. He was limited to one body. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he would be with them all the time. Wherever they were, the Holy Spirit would be with them. He would be their teacher. He would be their comforter. Jesus says, I'm leaving. But I'm not leaving you comfortless. I'm not leaving you alone. I am sending the comforter the teacher, the Holy Spirit of God to be with you. Just a few weeks, we're gonna study that because the Apostles' Creed says this, I believe in the Holy Spirit, and we wanna talk about what is the work of the Holy Spirit of God in your life and in my life today. Let me show you the fourth thing. The fourth thing is this, the ascension activates the believer's responsibility to evangelize. The ascension activates the believer's responsibility to evangelize. If you would, go back with me to Acts chapter one, and Jesus makes a couple of statements. Let me, let me make these statements, and we'll conclude today. Remember, the disciples said, hey, Lord, we got some questions for you. We got some timing questions for you. When are these prophecies going to be fulfilled? And, and by the way, when is this going to happen, and when is this going to happen and Jesus looks at them in verse 7, and he makes the statement. He says, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and those times. And by the way, he says, it's not for you to know. Here's what I drew from that. Here's what I wrote down in my notes. Believers are not to wait with complacency, but are commanded to evangelize with urgency. We talked about how to translate that in Spanish, and here's the way we translate it in Spanish. Believers aren't to sit with their brazos cruzados. They're not to sit with their arms crossed as if they were doing nothing. They've been called to do something. And by the way, th th these disciples are guilty of what we're guilty of sometimes. And church, at times, we're guilty of sitting in circles and trying to uh, guess, okay, when is Jesus coming back? And when is this going to come back? And, and we spend time trying to figure out 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. And when he doesn't come back in 1988, we're saying he's coming back here. And we're trying to figure that out. Jesus, tell us the times and the seasons. And Jesus says, listen, it's not your job to figure out the times and the seasons. It's my dad's job to know that. Well, what's our job then, God? Verse 8. But when the Holy Spirit of God comes upon you, you will be witnesses for me. Jesus says, man, you're not around this. You shouldn't sit around and be complacent. You should evangelize with urgency. You should be witnesses as to the death and burial of my death my burial, and my resurrection. The word witness is such a powerful word. It comes from the word from which we get our word martyr, somebody that's willing to witness with their very own life. And church, I'm afraid at times that we sit back and, and we become like sponges of biblical knowledge, but we don't give out what we're learning. And the idea is not for us to learn and learn and grasp and figure out and understand without using that in the lives of other people. You shall be witnesses. And as Jesus looked at the disciples and said that, he says it to each and every one of us today. Glenn, you should be a witness. Carla, you should be a witness. Dennis, you should be a witness. Mark, Mike, we could go one by one. All of us are called to be what? Witnesses. We're called to give testimony of the fact that Jesus is no longer dead. That tomb is not full. That tomb is empty. And he rose from the dead and he's in heaven making intercession for us. And my life is forever changed. We should be witnesses of that. When was the last time you gave witness of your faith today? We should be witnesses of Christ's death and resurrection. The last is this. The message of the gospel is to be taken everywhere. 
The message of the gospel. Jesus says, this used to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. The grammatical construction is really interesting. It doesn't say reach all of Jerusalem, and once you've reached all of Jerusalem, then and only then go to Judea. And once you've reached Jerusalem and Judea, then go to Samaria. And once you've reached Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, then and only then you go to the ends of the earth. Now he says, listen, reach Jerusalem, and while you're reaching Jerusalem, reach Judea. And while you're reaching Judea, reach Samaria. And while you're reaching Judea and Jerusalem and Samaria, go to the ends of the earth. The gospel is to be taken everywhere. That's why we have a missions program. That's why Mike and Amy left Hollywood Community Church and are taking the gospel to Burkina Faso. That's why today, I won't mention who they are, we have another one of our couples that are in Guatemala today praying about what God wants for them in the future. Why? We are commanded to take the gospel all around the world. That's our command. We shouldn't sit back with our arms crossed. We should evangelize with passion. Listen, the ascension is significant. It's significant because when Jesus ascended into heaven, he said, listen, I'm leaving, but my ministry is not over. I'm going to heaven, but I am working for you so that you will grow and so that you can fulfill the mission that I have given you to fulfill. And Jesus says, I'm coming back. And when I'm coming back, when I come back, you'll give an account of how you've used everything that I have given to you. Hey, church, God's given us a responsibility. He's given us all the tools that we need to accomplish that responsibility. We must be faithful in the task that God has given to us.